Hey, New Zealand. Hey, good evening. How are y'all doing? Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a pastor down in Houston, Texas, uh, in the United States. And it is just a blessing and an honor for me to be here to join you in this worship and to bring God's word to you. Uh, before we continue, uh, can we just ta- take some time and uh, bow in a word of prayer? Uh, I don't know where you're gathered. Maybe you're at church or maybe you're in the comfort of your own room. But let's spend a little time inviting God into our space and ask him to speak to us and really to offer this time to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, you're you're an awesome God. And for us to be able to call you our God is just such a blessing. Lord, as we enter into these three days that you have prepared for us, I pray, God, that you would be gracious and that you would pour your love upon us. Lord, especially you, Lord, I pray that you would show yourself to your youth in New Zealand, that you would speak to them, that you would enter into their times, their locations, and that you would meet with them. As we gather in spirit and truth during this time, will you help them to see and to learn how great you are how awesome you are, and that they would experience just your amazing love for them so that they would truly praise you from the depth of their hearts and that your name will be glorified in them. We give you this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Once again, uh, thank you. It's just an honor to be able to bring God's word to you. Once again, my name is Daniel Rhee. I'm a pastor here in Houston, Texas. And uh, just to introduce uh, myself to you a little bit, I have my wife, Haley, and I have three little kids, uh, eight-year-old, five-year-old, and a three-year-old, David, Ethan, and James. Uh, They're a rowdy bunch, but we love them, and uh, God has been just good to us. Uh, I'm currently serving a church here in Houston, uh, Living Water Ministry. Uh, I, I just recently came here not too long ago, last July. And uh, it, God has been doing some amazing stuff here. Uh, back before that, uh, I was in Seattle, Washington. And about seven years ago, God had called us to start this online church plant. And that was way before the pandemic. We had no idea what an online church uh, would be. Uh, but we started that journey. And uh, soon enough, I got connected with Costa. And we kind of journeyed through that together. And it was a blessing, and now, you know, here we are. We're connected through Costa Metaverse, and we're able to worship God and hear God's word together. And so it's, it's really a blessing, and I pray that this would be a time, these next three days would be a time that you get to spend time with God, that you get to meet God, and that God would really be able to speak his truth into your lives. You know, I, I've never been to New Zealand, and so uh, I, I really do want to go one day, hopefully, Uh, But I Googled New Zealand, and I found out some interesting facts. Uh, You know, I I guess you guys have more sheep than people, which is uh, (laughs) pretty interesting. Uh, You guys got the Hobbit Town or the Hobbit Village. Uh, You guys have the Kiwi Bird and just beautiful sceneries. I don't know if that encapsulates New Zealand, really. And so, you know, hopefully one day I'll go and find out. You know, people that never have been to Texas, uh, they say, you know, things like, Oh, it must be all cowboys and cattle farm and, you know, desert and those type of things. And, uh, you know, it it really doesn't uh, do Texas justice. Uh, You know, of course, they have cowboys. They, you know, we got uh, cattle, but, you know, it's a modern city. It's it's a great place. However, you know, we do have some quirks, right? We, um, Texas people, they, uh, they love country music. Uh, they have quirky things. They, they're crazy about barbecues. And um, this one thing that I used to do, so 20 years ago when I was in college, uh, I was also in Texas, in Austin, Texas. And uh, there's this thing called broomballing. I don't know if you guys know this. I don't know if this is unique to Texas, but anyway, uh, it's very quirky. I've never experienced it anywhere other than Texas. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's this very intricate, very sophisticated sport. Uh, you, you get a broom, and you're given a ball, and you hit the ball with the broom, 
uh, so that it goes into the goal <laughs> is uh, is basically what it sounds like. Uh, so you you would go to an ice rink uh, and basically instead of playing hockey, ice hockey with skates and with a stick and a puck, uh, you would actually just get a broom, a plastic ball, no skates. And so you're gliding and, and slipping on ice, falling left and right. And, and it's fun. You know, so when I was back in college, uh, we would take the whole entire college group and we would go once a year to broom ball. And it was fun enough to where people actually got into it and people got pretty competitive. Now, on this one time that we went, uh, we were playing five minutes before the game was over. We were down a point. And on my team, my college pastor at the time, 20 years ago, he was on my team. And we had this dramatic last goal moment where I somehow passed the goal to or passed the ball to him and he somehow with his broom hit that ball and it just went straight into the goal and we scored an equalizer and everybody was cheering so I started running to him to give him a high five but you know running on ice is pretty hard and, and he was running towards me and before we knew it we were kind of going a little too fast and we couldn't stop ourselves I gave him a high five and he just fell flat, like his legs flew up and he just fell with a big boom and he hit his, the back of his head on ice. See, another thing about Texas, uh, people here don't really believe in helmets. They, they ride their motorcycles on the highway without helmets. They ride their bicycles without helmets. So naturally, we didn't have helmets. And he passed out for a few seconds and then he came back. And we were so concerned about him. We said, hey, pastor, are you doing okay? Are you okay? His head was still shaking a little bit. And so we decided to take him to the ER, to the hospital. And I, I told him to get into my car instead of driving himself. So he got into my car. My sister was there in the front seat. His fiance was there in the back seat. And his fiance was really worried. She was sobbing. She was like, Opa, are you okay? Uh, they were about to get married in Korea only two weeks later. And so we were really concerned. And as on our drive to the hospital, that's why this thing happened where uh, the pastor tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hey, Daniel. Um, and I said, yeah, yeah, pastor, like, is everything okay? You okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, let's still go to the ER. But, and then he started whispering into my ear. He's like, but who, who's that girl sobbing, sobbing right next to me? And we thought that he was, just kind of joking, trying to lighten up the mood, right? Not to, so that his fiance wouldn't worry too, too much. And so we laughed. I was like, ah, oh, pastor, you know, you're funny. You know, that's your fiance. And he goes, ah, you guys are funny. No, she's not my fiance. And we're like, what are you talking about? Of course she's your fiance. Come on. And, and then, you know, it, it, things got a little bit serious. He, he, his tone got a little serious. And he's like, oh, no, guys, come on, stop it, stop it. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know who you are, but, you know. Come on, guys, she's not even my type. Like, who is she? At that moment, like, we all froze. We were like, whoa, what just happened? It turned out that he had short-term memory loss, and he totally forgot about his fiance. <laughs> and, and he forgot about the moment that he introduced her to the college group with the biggest smile on his face saying, man, this is, I'm so happy, and I get to marry the love of my life. He, he totally forgot our private conversation where he came to me and said, Daniel, like, I'm so blessed. I get to marry this beautiful lady. I'm so lucky. He forgot all of that. And in that moment, he entered into this weird reality where because of his memory loss, he, he was single. He, he didn't have a girlfriend or he didn't have a fiance. And, and he, I mean, he remembered everybody else, but he just didn't have a fiancé in his reality. And his fiancé's reality shook too because she was about to commit to him for the rest of her life in two weeks. And now he doesn't even remember her and just said that she's not his type. I felt so bad. Um, but thankfully, praise God, uh, you know, he regained his memory after a little bit and he remembered her and uh, they're married now. And so that's all good. But the reason why I share this uh, story is because whether it's due to memory or whether it's due to other reasons, uh, we kind of act similarly. Like in one moment, we have the love of our lives, God the Father loving us, and, and just we, we have this amazing life planned out. 
uh, Jesus Christ saved us, and we're on our knees crying and worshiping him. And then in another moment, we walk into this world, and it's as if we have this memory loss where we don't remember any of that. We, we act as if God doesn't exist in our lives, and, and we're just living according to the patterns of this world. And I, I believe that today's passage and what God wants to share with us, it's not that he doesn't understand or he's trying to chastise us. He's not trying to rebuke you, but he's trying to speak the truth to you. So I hope that we're ready for that. Today's passage comes from Psalm 13. Uh, from the book of Psalms 13. And this is a poem, a song that has been written by David, King David. And as we start to read this psalm, you're going to see that David is kind of engaged in these two different realities. And I hope you can see this. Psalm 13, if you have your Bibles, please open up to Psalm 13. How long, Lord? How long? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Come on, how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Okay, but, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. See, David starts off in this weird reality as if God is not there in his life as if God has forgotten about him he, he's he's suffering he's probably under a lot of pressure from all the enemies around him and he's just like God like where are you like what are you doing are you about to leave me to die here you know that's what happens uh, when our understanding of reality gets messed up when our understanding of reality gets messed up, we, we start to see things differently and we start to feel things differently. And all of a sudden, we start entering into these realities that are just not based upon truth. You know, one of the things that I hope to, uh, maybe this is helpful, I, I hope so. The only way that a reality enters into us is through our eyes and our ears. I mean, through our senses, right? And it goes through our, our, our mind. It goes into our hearts. And our reality gets bottlenecked into uh, our, our mind. And so whatever we see, whatever we hear, whatever we sense, we start to interpret that and process that. And whatever we accept as real, we think is real. And it's kind of weird because... Uh, especially it's hard for youth, as you are growing up, you're starting to see the reality, you're starting to develop your worldview, you're starting to kind of try to make sense of the things in your life. And it's hard because initially all you see is the stuff on surface level. It's really hard. I remember when I was a youth, it was, it was really hard. One of the things that was hard was for me to understand why my parents didn't like me. I didn't understand why my parents never thought I was good enough or would always yell at me or, would, you know, whenever I bring a report card home uh, or I would do something that I'm not supposed to do, they would say, come on, like, and, and I would get in trouble. I just didn't understand that. And so I thought, man, my parents just don't really love me or something like that. But like I said, I, I have kids now and it took quite a long time for me to finally understand the real reality. See, the reality is that even though your parents might yell at you, might discipline you, might do all those things, your parents love you more than they have ever loved anybody in their entire life. 
Let me say that. Like, again, your parents, I mean, I love my kids more than I have ever loved anybody in my life. When I, when I had my first kid, I didn't know that I was capable, that a human being was capable to love somebody this much. But that's the reality. That's the reality. And it takes a long time for you to start to see that reality. Why? Because this world is so filled with broken things, with doubt, with understanding that is all messed up, with lies. And it just, it just taints and tampers with everything that we're taking in. See, this is not just something that I'm thinking or some philosopher came up with. This is straight from the Bible. See, when Jesus Christ came in Matthew chapter 6, this is what he said. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And Jesus Christ is saying, look, your eyes are seeing this world. And if you are able to see this world for what it is, the way that I've created it, the true reality, the spiritual realities, the way things really are, then light will come into your body and you will have light in you. You'll be healthy. But because your eyes are unhealthy, because the things that you see and the way that you are processing in your mind is very unhealthy, darkness is all through your body. See, what Jesus Christ is talking about is what, what Isaiah prophesied as a curse. Isaiah, one of the prophets, uh, prophesied because God told him to. He said, you know what, because Israel had been sinning so much, I want you to prophesy to them. I want you to spread this curse that even though you think you're seeing, you will never perceive. And even though you hear things, you will never understand. Because if you perceive and if you understand, you may change your heart, repent, and be healed. But God said, you've been unfaithful. And you rebel so much, I'm going to put this curse on you. And Jesus Christ is coming and saying, look, your eyes are unhealthy. And look at how deep your darkness is. See, we experience that in our daily lives where even if we have people around us that love us deeply, we go on to this reality of Instagram or reality of just our social circles and we feel, we say this stuff. We say like, how come nobody loves me? How come people don't like me? Yet God has surrounded you with people that love you. There are these people who are, have so much money, so much resources, so much wealth. And yet they're always wanting something more. They feel like they're always poor. So they're, they're like the wealthiest beggars. And you got these people who are so foolish yet prideful because their mind is set on pride and is bent on pride. They go, hey, I know what I'm doing. Don't try to teach me. I know where I'm going. Yet clearly everybody can see that they're headed towards the wrong path that leads to destruction. That's what our brain does when we are not able to process reality and really understand it for what it is. See, some of you might think, man, this is, uh, this is confusing. Like, I don't like this philosophy type of stuff. I can't. I just like things simple. But the truth is, God has created your brain so marvelously and so complicated that you do this on a daily basis. All right? You do it even subconsciously. You go to school, and there might be people that speak negative things to you, or in your social circles, they might say, oh, you're ugly, or you're not happy, or you're, you're, you're not funny, or you're weird. And, and sometimes we take that and we go, ah, oh, that's just false. And we don't let it bother us. But then there are times when we're uh, scrolling through our feed and, or some people sp say some negative stuff to us, and, and we, we take it in. We accept it as reality. We start putting our trust in it, and all of a sudden, we start getting depressed because in our reality, we're nothing. We start becoming anxious because in our reality, nothing is set. We, we start having panic attacks. We start having all these doubts. We start, start feeling like there's no way out. 
See, this type of false reality, this type of thought, uh, it, it doesn't just come about naturally. See, God created us so good. And God created us so that he could love us and that we could love him. But in the brokenness of this world, something has happened to where our reality does not line up and we are not able to see the truth. See, um, I love Korean dramas. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an avid fan. Uh, I mean, the recent ones with like all the zombies and all the, you know, violence and all that. I mean, kudos to Korea for coming up with these uh, world recognized dramas. But I'm talking more about like the old romance dramas, right? Where there's all these drama happening and all these twists in the plot. And there's always this, uh, this one plot line where the main character, the girl and the guy, they, they meet, they have some struggles, but then they start falling for each other. They, they you know, start loving each other and they, they go through this happy time. But there's always this side character. And in this one drama, there was this one girl who, who you know, on the appearance might be even more attractive than the main character. But because of her, uh, the way that she acted in the drama, right, it was just like, uh, right? And like just very, very chijire and like very just messed up. Like, you know, everybody started hating her, you know, kind of thing. But she was always envious of this relationship. So one day she just casually walks up to the main character girl and, and she drops a bomb at her. She goes, Oh, didn't you know? And the main character girl goes, What are you talking about? She goes, Really? You really didn't know this? You didn't know that his family and my family already prearranged our marriage and he already said yes? <gasps> what? You didn't know? And then boom, boom, right? Korean drama begins, right? The dramatic background music kicks in. And he goes, oh, poor you. You're so naive. What, you thought that he actually loved you? Oh, no, he was just playing with you. And then he's going to come to me. And then she just casually walks off, right? <laughs> in that moment with those lies planted now in the main character's heart she then goes to uh the boy you know splashes water in his face slaps him across the face and says i don't ever want to see you again don't ever come find me and she walks off into the darkness and he's standing there what just happened what just happened their realities were aligned they both loved each other but because of lies, this reality just got totally twisted up. See, in our lives, in our realities, that's what happens. The Bible says that Satan is the father of all lies and will continually try to deceive you, continually try to mess you up. See, one of the lies that Satan sows all the time, and I can just ask this question is, are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus? And if you don't know how to answer this, I mean, you might have grown up in the church or you might have just recently come to know Jesus Christ. We get confused about this question all the time because we want to say yes, but we don't know if we can. Right? We, we want to say yes. We want to jump up and down and praise his name and say, Jesus, you're my everything. I follow after you. But then all of a sudden there are these there are these. Uh, testimonies, there's witnesses that testify against us with proof of our sin. Oh, no, you don't love Jesus Christ. I mean, you were just watching these lustful things. No, you don't love Jesus Christ. You got hate, hatred in your heart. You, you, you didn't even forgive that person yet. Oh, you have all this greed in your heart. You have all this envy. You don't love Jesus. And we get confused. And the truth is, yeah, yeah we, we do sin. And we're terrible at following Jesus Christ. See, even the great disciple Peter at one point thought in his reality, in his perception, that he was a good follower of Jesus, that he was going to follow Jesus even till his death. And Jesus looks at him and goes, come on, Peter, truly I tell you, before this night is over, you're going to have to deny me three times. And Peter goes, what are you talking about, Jesus? But sure enough, he does. We're sinful people. A lot of times we're deceived not to even look at that. But into this sinful life of ours, 
is where Jesus Christ came. See, if we don't accept the fact that we are sinful, we are messed up to our core, we don't understand what Jesus Christ did on that cross. Because Jesus Christ came down from heaven to earth into our darkness. The light of the world came into our darkness got tempted by, the devil tried to tempt him, but did not fall at any of those temptations, lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross, taking all of this messed up reality with him, and he nailed it to the cross, and then he came back to life, and he said, I am doing a new thing now. I have overcome death. I'm creating a new creation. And he's calling you and I into that new creation. He says, if you are in me, even though you think that you're part of this old, worldly, broken reality, you are no longer part of this broken reality. The old has gone, the new has come, you are a new creation in me. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. He came back from, he from hell itself and he says, I am creating a new thing. And in those moments when we put our trust in that and we're trying to follow after Jesus Christ and we say, yes, I follow you, I follow you, but we fall. I follow you, I follow you, but we fall. And we go, yes, I am a Christian, I am Christian. And the devil stands up and says, no, 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 no. And he starts developing all these witnesses that accuse us against that and say, no, you don't follow Jesus. You're not in Christ. You're not with God. In those moments, Jesus Christ stands right in front of us and says, I got this. Because all of these proofs, all of these evidence of our sin, he, he says, I've already paid for that on the cross. And he takes his righteousness, his perfect life, and he puts it on us. He says, there's nothing that will separate you from the love of God the Father anymore. He says, death has lost his power. It has lost its sting. You no longer are ruled by the law of sin and death, but you are ruled by the law of spirit and life in my new creation. And he says, there's nothing on heaven and our, or on earth, no angels nor demons, no height nor depth, no principalities in this world, nothing that will separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. See, that's the gospel. That's the truth that he's trying to share. See, David in our psalm today, he walks into the psalm in a broken reality saying, God, where are you? Because he's living in this broken world. He, he's, he's involved in this brokenness and he's following the patterns of this world. And he's like, man, like what happened to all this? I'm feeling pain. I'm feeling sorrow in my heart. God is no, nowhere to be found. Where is this God? What's going on, God? Are you just going to let me die here? And a lot of us, we share in that lament. We look at our broken world and we look at our broken lives. We look at our broken selves. We go, God, come on. Don't you see that I'm suffering here? Don't you see that I'm crumbling with this panic? Don't you see that I'm crumbling with this anxiety? Don't you see that I'm so lonely all by myself? Don't you see that I have pain in my life? Where are you, God? Where are you? But in those moments, God comes into our lives. And Jesus breaks that reality. The Holy Spirit speaks the truth into our lives and light shines into us. Jesus says, look, I have begun a new thing. You are now a beloved of God. You've already been set free. You're just wearing prison clothes. You have already been healed. You're just in recovery. You're going to rule the heavens and the earth with me. To David, he goes, I have never left your side. I have never forsaken you. I've always been there. He goes, look, you think you have sorrow right now. I have created this reality in where there will be no more pain and sorrow. I will wipe every tear from your eyes. I will take every pain away. He says, death 
will no longer overcome you. See, brothers and sisters in New Zealand, you're going through a tough time. And being youth is tough enough. Being a teenager is hard enough. But being a teenager in this pandemic is going to mess you up in all different types of ways. And Satan will take advantage of this in every single possible way. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So hear my voice. Though your heart may be full of grief, weeping will only stay for one night. Joy will come with the morning. Though you may feel defeated by your own addictions, your sins, Christ has wiped away all of those sins. Sin no longer has power. It has lost its sting. Though you feel like death is coming at you, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus who sent his Holy Spirit into our lives. And he said, he who is in you is greater than he who is in this world. See, the truth is that you are sons and daughters of God Most High. That is the reality. And there is nothing, no witness, no accusation that can stand in between you and God and eternity. God loves you. Not in some distant future when you somehow make your life better, but right now he loves you. So when David sings this psalm, and it seems like God forgot about him, it seems like God forgot about you, it seems like God is hiding his face from you and you're just wrestling with your own life and with your own thoughts all by yourself, God says, no. I love you. Light came into David's eyes and his psalm changed 180 degrees. He said, oh my Lord, how did I forget? I trust in your unfailing love and my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for you have been good to me. And I pray, my brothers and sisters, that you will join in that song. That you will join in that song. And when you do, when you put your trust in the Lord, you know, when you look at your reality around you and say, you know what? I'm not going to trust in my feelings. I'm not going to trust in all these broken things. Uh, lies. I'm just going to trust in the truth. That's how you can discern. That's how you can discern and, and walk away from the patterns of the world and discern God's will for your life. That's when false reality is dispelled. See, Jesus Christ came and he said in John chapter 8, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, if you hold on, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in James, he said, look, don't just merely listen to my word, so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at himself in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Look, in the next three days, God is going to pour down his truth upon you. He is going to share with you and reveal to you the real things. He's going to expose all the lies in your life. And you're going to look intently into what God has says, what God is saying to you. And I am hoping that you will hold on to that and say, God, this is so good and so true. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to write it in my journal. I'm going to write it on the posters. I'm going to hold this in my life. I'm not going to forget it. Because otherwise, you're going to go and, and do what this Bible passage says. You're just going to forget about it. You're going to forget about who you really are in Christ. And you're going to walk in this world as if you don't know. And you're just going to walk according to the patterns of the world with all the lies and brokenness. But it continues to say in James chapter 1, 25, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Brothers and sisters in New Zealand, I pray that for the next three days, as God reveals his truth to you, as God opens your eyes to see really what is true, 
as God opens your ear to, to, so that you can hear his love for you. Will you look intently into the word of God? Will you hold fast to it and start making that part of who you are? And I believe God will bless you mightily. He will help you stand firm in this world that continues to rock back and forth. And you'll be able to say, I trust in your unfailing love for me. I trust in your unfailing love for me. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will praise you for you have been good. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you are an amazing God that you come into our darkness and that you reveal the truth to us. Lord, I, I confess that living in this world and especially in these times, Lord, our, our minds, our thoughts, our feelings continually goes through storms. And especially my youth in, in New Zealand, Lord, I pray, God, as they continually go through storms in their thoughts and they walk through the valleys in their thoughts, Lord, I pray, will you shout your warmth into their lives? Will you still those waves? And will you speak your love and your truth into their lives? And as they do, as they hear, as they listen, will you allow them to hold on and to remain in you, to see just the beauty of this new creation of yours and to see in this reality who they are so that they may discern the life that you have given them. We thank you, Lord, as in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.